Well, now, when I was a little boy, I grew up in a Christian country. There's a bit of a, an echo on this uh, microphone. Um, oh, can you hear that? Humming, so can I. Turn the volume about down a wee bit. Good. I was brought up in a Christian country as a boy. I don't mean that everybody in England was a Christian, but it was the only religion there was. And most villages and towns had at least a church, an Anglican church, and a Methodist chapel. There were a few others, Salvation Army and Baptists and so on. But every religious building of worship in England was Christian. There was one Muslim mosque just outside London. And so the choice in Britain was be a Christian or stay in bed on Sunday morning. There was nothing much else to do. Now, if you go to the main shopping street, Oxford Street in London, you'll wonder which country you're in. Because we have been overwhelmed with immigrants from West Indies, from Pakistan, from Africa. And we are now a truly international country, as you have been here for many years. And so we now have the situation where the religions of the world have come to us and are now living alongside each other. You've been used to that for years here. You have a Chinese quarter, an Indian quarter, and I don't know what else, but you've been used to different religions living side by side. We are just learning as a country how to do that. How are these religions going to settle down with each other? Will they ever settle down? There are four possible relationships between them. The first is one of hostility and antagonism. And history has been full of religious wars. A lot of blood has been shed in the name of faith. There have been many struggles between religions, between Islam and Christianity, for example, between Hindus and Christians, between different kinds of religion, and even within the same religion. I could give you one instance of the war between Iran and Iraq, which was essentially between two varieties of Islam, the Sunni and the Shiite. Or I could take her to Northern Ireland, where Catholics and Protestants have been killing each other until recently. And it's a scandal. Are we going to go on like this forever? We're going to see endless religious wars in the name of faith. That's one possibility. The second possibility, which is being tried in various places, is called separatism. And that means to keep them apart. Eventually it leads to ghettos, and one part of the town belongs to one religion and another to another. That's now a feature of English life. There's a little town in Yorkshire called Dewsbury. It has a river running through the middle, and everybody on one side is Muslim, even the churches have become mosques, and everybody on the other side is everything else. There are even notices in certain cities in Britain that say you are now entering a zone of Sharia law. Incredible though that sounds. We are seeing separatism. Keep the religions apart and then we can keep the peace. Lock them up in their own ghetto. That's not the solution. The third solution is called pluralism. It's another ism. It's a philosophy that variety is good for a society and therefore you encourage all religions, especially minority religions. And it's 
supposed to be good for a country. It's based on the idea that all religions are equal, that they are all roads leading to the same God, and therefore we should have them all with us. It's basically called relativism, and each religion is regarded to have some of the truth, and therefore we need them all, each contributing to the pool of knowledge. The fourth solution is now becoming the most common one, and the Bible predicts that it will be the main solution before we reach the end of the age, and that is called syncretism, persuading the religions of the world to get together, to act together, until there is one religion uniting the whole human race. That will happen, according to my Bible, before the end. It's begun to happen in my country. Prince Charles, who will be our next king, should inherit a title of the sovereign of Britain. It's on every coin in our land. It's called Defender of the Faith. And everybody thinks that's the Christian faith, but he wants to change the vow he takes when he's crowned king. He wants to be known as defender of faith, whatever faith that is. And he is already commending other faiths to the British people. The government now no longer talks about church or churches. It talks about the community of faith, and it lumps us all together in that community of faith. There's a pressure on us to get together with other religions, and uh, the pressure is for the sake of community peace, to bring some harmony into the community. And so there is real pressure on different faiths to get, to get it together. Of course, they can't get it together on their beliefs because they vary so greatly that you could never combine them. As far as doctrine goes, all religions of the world could be wrong, but only one can be right. And so we'll never be able to get the beliefs of different religions together, but the hope is that we might get the behavior of different religions together. That's why the word virtues has been replaced by the word values. And it's on a base of common values that the religions are being pressed to get it together. And already, different religions in my country are acting together against social evil. They're acting together against the poor and against other social evils, hoping to share the same values. Now, you may not know this, but when Muhammad himself wanted to combine with the other two religions that believed in one God, monotheists as they were called, he issued a call to them. And it's a very powerful appeal for other relig religions to come and join him. And it was entitled, A Common Word. And he appealed to those other two religions, Christianity and Judaism, with this common word, we both love God, we both love our neighbor, why don't we get together? Now, interestingly enough, after a gap of, well, 1400 years, the Muslims have made another appeal, entitled with the same words, a common word, and they've issued it to evangelical Christians. And the appeal is, let's love God and love our neighbor together. And uh, it has been responded to by 200 leading evangelicals around the world, and the response has been positive. This may surprise you. But leading evangelicals, I, I dare to name them, John Stott, Brother Andrew, 
George Verwer, the leaders of Youth of the Mission, have all signed a positive statement back to the Muslims and saying we are prepared to try and get together and discuss this. So there's a tremendous pressure on all kinds of Christians to syncretize religion and it will ultimately succeed. There will be a world religion led by a false prophet and the pressure will be on all of us to join. Now, how do we prepare for that? What is our defense against that pressure? And it's growing daily in my country and I believe that my sense is that it will grow here and you will also be subject to the same pressure. There is a very simple answer to it all, and that is to be sure of the uniqueness of Christ. That's the only thing that we can use to prepare to meet the pressures that will be on us. And I'm going to speak tonight about that the uniqueness of Christ that makes him quite different. By uniqueness, we mean that he's one of a kind, that there's no one else like him, that he cannot be compared with any other religion. He can only be contrasted with them. And so I want to go through the life of Jesus and say what is absolutely unique about our Lord Jesus Christ that makes him different from every other religious leader, every other religious founder in the whole wide world and will always prevent us from falling for the idea that we can bring our religions together and make them one. Many people have tried this. There's a faith called the Baha'i faith whose headquarters is in uh, Israel itself. And that faith aimed to bring all religions of the world together of those who shared the same values. An American statesman called John Foster Dulles incorporated the World Congress of Faiths, which still meets, and that has the same objective. So let's turn from all that to the gospel stories and learn again what is absolutely unique about our Lord Jesus Christ, which means we will never be able to mix our faith with any other. I'm going to start with his birth. Actually, Jesus' birth was fairly normal. Mary, after some hours of labor, produced a baby boy. That's fairly normal. The only different feature was that Mary's hymen was pierced by a male from the inside. Usually that happens by a male from the outside at the first act of intercourse. But her male baby pierced the opening to her womb from the inside. Apart from that, Jesus' birth was like everybody else's. You've got to go back nine months before the birth to find what was unique about that birth. And you find then that he was born without any intercourse between a man and a woman, a virgin birth. Incidentally, even the Muslims believe that firmly about Jesus, that he was born of a virgin who had never had any sex with a man. Now that's not unknown in history. There have been others. Uh, a professor of gynecology in London University told me that there were at least half a dozen other claims in history for virgin births, and he was inclined to accept them for a very particular reason. It happens under a process which the scientists call parthenogenesis. And that's when a female egg spontaneously divides and goes on dividing and developing 
into a fetus and ultimately into a new individual. It happens in the plant world. There's quite a lot of parthenogenesis in the plant world. There is also the same in the animal world. I think I was told that the Komodo dragon, which is native to a land not far from here, can do the same thing. But here are claims that it's happened to human beings. The professor told me the reason why I'm inclined to believe those claims is that in every single case, it was a little girl. And that's all it could be, because every egg in a woman's body is female, and a female is quite incapable of producing a male child. That makes the birth of Jesus or the conception of Jesus quite unique. It seems as if the only way it could have been done was for God to create a male sperm carrying his own DNA. And with that, her egg was fertilized. Every other way that's been suggested would mean that Mary wasn't the mother of Jesus just an incubator, a foster mother. But Jesus was truly the son of Mary. But it also meant that God would be his father. And that surely is absolutely unique. Nobody else has ever claimed that, but he did. And that's not the only surprising thing about his conception and birth. The most startling feature is this. He was the only human being who has ever lived on earth who chose to be born. I didn't choose to be born. You didn't choose to be born. I didn't choose my parents, nor did you. But Jesus did. And the amazing thing is that he chose very humble parents and quite a poor home. But again and again, he never said, I was born. He always said, I came to do this. I came to seek and save the lost. I decided to come. And that is absolutely unique. No other religious leader or founder ever claimed to choose to be born. They were simply born as an accident, as it were, as we all were. But Jesus said, I came. That's the first great unique thing about Christ which sets him apart, one of a kind, who can't be fitted into any category. Now, the surprising thing is that for the most famous person who ever lived, we know so little about him. There is nothing about him in the first 12 years of his life. We know nothing except that there was an attempt to murder him very early, which resulted in many of his cousins being killed who were in Bethlehem at the time. But his boyhood is largely hidden from us until the curtain is pulled aside at the age of 12. And when we see what he is doing then, it is quite surprising. Now, every Jewish boy has a bar mitzvah. It's a ceremony in which he changes from being a boy to a man. I wish we had such a ceremony today. I think it's a very good idea because it recognizes responsibility. And a Jewish boy goes to the synagogue. He reads part of the law of Moses, which is saying to the people, I am now responsible for myself to keep this law. Up to the age of 12, parents are responsible for the behavior of their Jewish children. But at 12, the boy becomes an adult. And from that moment, he puts away all his toys. He puts away childish things. And then he joins his father in whatever trade or profession his father has. 
Now it seems that they took Jesus not to the synagogue for his bar mitzvah, but to the temple in Jerusalem. And his mother and father traveled with him up to the capital city of Israel. Now I want to tell you how they traveled. They walked. No buses, no trains, they walked. And this is how they walked. The women set off first with the children under 12. And they walked 15 miles each day. And when they reached the place they were going to spend the night, they put the tents up, cooked the evening meal. And by the time they'd got that ready, all the men arrived. <laughs> Do you like the idea? Feminists don't seem very excited, but that's how they used to walk. And they took Jesus to the temple, gave him his bar mitzvah. He was duly given the ceremony. And then they set off walking home. And Joseph and Mary walked 15 miles down towards the Jordan Valley and then met up at evening for the meal. And Mary said to Joseph, Where, where's Jesus? And Joseph said, well, he's not my boy. I thought he would be with you. And then they realized each had thought he would be traveling with the other away from Jerusalem. And that explains why they lost him. They went back to Jerusalem. They searched for three days. And finally, they found him back in the temple, having an amazing discussion with the priests. And Mary, typical mother, she said, your father and I have been looking everywhere for you. Why did you do this to us? Where have you been? Now notice what she said, your father and I. And what did he reply? He said, but I'm 12. I've joined my father in his business. Did you expect that? And it must have come as a shock to the parents. They had never told him how he was born or conceived. They, she'd kept these things in her heart for 12 years. And yet here he is, he knows perfectly well who his father is. Your father and I have been looking everywhere for you. My father, I've joined him in this business. You should have come first to the temple, that's where you'd find me. And that's a little glimpse we have of a unique boy who already had a unique relationship with God, called him father. And his favorite word for that was dada, or daddy. Because every Jewish boy or baby is taught his first word, abba, which means daddy. And you see a Jewish father leaning over the pram looking proudly at his son and this great big monster face peering at the little baby. He says, Abba, Abba, Abba. And finally the baby, to get rid of this monstrous face, <laughs> says, Abba. And the father says, he said it, he's recognized me. I remember going for a walk on an archeological site in Israel with a, a father and the little boy was dragging behind and getting more and more tired. And he came running after us with his little hands stretched out wanting to be picked up. And I heard for the first time someone say, Abba, Abba. It's a profound word. And Jesus said to his followers, that's what you ought to call God. And no Jew would ever dare to use such intimacy with Almighty God when God had said, don't take my, my name in vain. Well, that's his birth, which was unique. That's his boyhood, which is unique. And then the curtain comes down again for another 18 years, and we know nothing more. It is extraordinary that we know so little about him. We presume, because he was called the carpenter later, that he went back to Nazareth and amazingly it says he was subject to his parents. 
and then took over the father's business of carpentry and made chairs and tables and window frames and door frames. If God had put any of you in charge of planning the life of his son to be the savior of the world, I'll guarantee you'd have arranged meetings and crusades and I don't know what else for him. <laughs> you would not have put him in a carpenter's shop for 18 years. But that's what God the Father did. And he was 18 years a woodworker and three years a wonder worker. And if my mathematics are right, that's a ratio of six to one. What does that remind you of? He said, my father works until now, now, now I work. And when you turn back to Genesis 1, to God's work of creation, there it is again, six to one. And it's interesting that God the Father put his son to ordinary work with his hands for six years to one year of miracles and message. So that's all we know about this most famous person who ever lived until the age of 30. And then he strode onto the public stage of history and within months was famous throughout the then world and famous for many things. The extraordinary question that's raised is this. After only three years of public ministry, he is judicially murdered as one of the worst criminals who ever lived. And every person must try and answer the question, why should such a tragedy happen? Let's look at the unusual features of those three-year ministry to see if we can answer that question. There are three aspects of what Jesus did in public. The first were his miracles. The second was his morality. And the third was his message. Somehow, for one of those three things, he was regarded as the most dangerous man alive who must, must be put to death before he did harm to the whole people. Was it his miracles? Well, he certainly did miracles. Do you know that in the records of Jesus outside the Bible, we have historians who wrote about him, Roman historians, Jewish historians, not part of the Bible, but they all agree on one thing, that Jesus was a miracle worker. And certainly that is the most attested fact about him. His miracles divide into two groups. The miracles he did on people and the miracles he did with things. And both are remarkable. The difference is that some of his miracles on people were being done by other people at the same time. He mentions that. He cast demons out of people, but others did that. And he once said to those others, why are you accusing me of doing this by the power of the devil? By whose power are you doing it? So clearly there were other miracles at the time of healing disease, of casting out demons. And he did both. But the supreme miracle he did with people, which nobody else was doing at the time, was raising the dead. He stopped a funeral of a poor widow who only had this one son to look after her. And he stopped the funeral and raised the man out of his coffin and gave him, gave him back to the widow. That was quite a miracle. But there was one miracle he did with a man which was really unique. A man who was already in his grave and had been there for the four days. And his own sister said, we can't open the tomb because he stinks. 
He'll be rotted by now. And yet he called Lazarus out of that grave, restored a putrefying body to perfect health, and then said, take the grave clothes off him, let him go. That hastened his own death, but not directly. It did make the leaders of the nation, particularly the religious leaders, envious. And that was one of the motives that led to his death, but not the main one. So here is a man who used miraculous power to do amazing things for people and to do amazing things with things. A man who could stand up in a boat and tell the wind and the waves to shut up. He didn't say, peace be still. That's the polite version we have in our Bibles. He actually said, get muzzled. The way you talk to a puppy dog that was jumping up at you and spoiling your clothes, get down. That's, what it, that's how he spoke to the wind and the waves, as if they were a little puppy dog. And they obeyed him. And immediately the men, men who were with him in the boat said, what kind of a man is this? that even the wind and the waves do what he tells them. He also changed water into wine. One American pastor tried to tell me he didn't, but changed it into tomato juice. But I'm sure that's <laughs> not the truth. He changed it in, into the best wine at a wedding. And they said, why have you kept the best wine to last? Because the normal procedure was to give them the good one at first, and then when they were half drunk, pass off bad wine to them. But he gave them the best one at the end, and he'd made it out of water. That's a real miracle with things that nobody else did at the time. And then also, he took two fishes and a few buns of bread, and he'd said to the disciples, there are 5,000 people listening to me all day and they've had no food. Why don't you feed them? And the disciples said, well, we haven't got anything. And there are no shops nearby. And then they found a little boy. This poor boy had two fish and five little buns of bread for his picnic lunch. And the disciples confiscated it. <laughs> and they said to Jesus, here's some food we found for 5,000 people. Ridiculous. But Jesus took those two fish and the five pieces of bread and he just kept breaking bits off and giving them to the disciples. Just take this to the, tell them to sit down in 50 groups of 50. Now take this to them and take this. He was creating that while he distributed it. That's a great miracle. And then on one occasion, he came to a fig tree expecting to find some figs because he was hungry and he had nothing to eat. And he found no figs on it. So he cursed the tree. Now make of that what you will, but he did that. And the next day when they came into Jerusalem by the same path, they said, look, the tree you curse, it's dead. All the leaves have fallen. And you can see the tree is just a skeleton, it's dead. Now all these things he did with nothing more than a word. So those miracles were real miracles. But none of them harmed anyone. All of his miracles did good things for people. And that's why years later, Simon Peter said, when he preached about Jesus, he went about doing good. Why then should he be put to death within three years for just going about doing good? It's obviously not his miracles that were the problem. So let's move on to the second part of his public ministry, his morality. Now you wouldn't dare say to your best friend, 
can you find anything wrong in me? <laughs> and you certainly wouldn't say to your people that you work with, I'm humble. <laughs> and yet Jesus did both and got away with it. He said, which of you convicteth me of sin? And he's talking to his worst enemies. And even one of his closest friends, Simon Peter, once said to him, Lord, depart from me, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. I'm not for the likes of you, I shouldn't be a friend of yours. It was the testimony of his cousin, John the Baptist, when he came for baptism. Baptism is to get you cleaned up to wash away your sins. And John the Baptist said, I, I shouldn't be baptizing you, you should be baptizing me. Which means that the first Baptist wasn't baptized. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> and uh, incidentally, did you know that the New Testament called Jesus a Baptist? He was a Baptist. The same word applied to John the Baptist is applied to Jesus on the same page. So there we are. Baptist small b, not big b. But John said, you're clean. You've nothing to wash away. Why do you come to be baptized? And Jesus said, it's right to do what is right. And any Christian who's not baptized and says, I don't need to be, needs to remember that Jesus was the only person who didn't need to be, and he was. So follow his example. John the Baptist said, you're clean. Peter said, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. And the enemies of Jesus, when he challenged them to find anything faulty in his character, were silent. Now the life of Jesus has been more written about, mulled over, examined than any other life, and no one has found any sleaze, any corruptibility in him, nobody. In 2,000 years, and they've dug around in his life in detail, none of them. Not only that, but he taught the highest moral standards for other people as well. Everybody admits that who's read the Sermon on the Mount. People like Mahatma Gandhi or the Russian Dostoevsky, many a person has said the Sermon on the Mount is the highest moral standard that any teacher has dared to make. The only criticism that people have made of Jesus' moral teaching was that it's too high a standard, that it's impossible to keep. But Jesus was not like many teachers who lower the standards to make it easier for people to reach them. Jesus came to lift people to the high standard, and that was his approach to morality. Now why should a person who himself was so moral and who taught others to be so moral, why should they kill a man like that with the most horrible death there's ever been? That's the big question still. So we must turn from his miracles and his morality to his message. There must be something in what he said that caused him to be crucified. And that is the truth, that's the answer. And when you look at his message, the astonishing thing is that nobody, but nobody, ever talked so much about himself. And in anybody else, that would be sheer egotism. A person is usually boring who is always talking about himself. Have you got a friend who always does that? Don't you wish they'd talk about you? <laughs> I know one or two people who begin every other sentence with I, and they are boring people. 
They're only interested in themselves. And Jesus said more about himself than anybody else. And yet he never bored people. What did he say? Do you know, early on in his career, they sent soldiers to arrest him. And they didn't dare. And they came back and simply said, never did a man speak like this man. We dare not arrest him. He's just different. He speaks like nobody else. And the simple answer is that in 10 different ways, as he spoke about himself, he was actually saying he was God. And that's why they crucified him. Let me go through 10 hints that he dropped in his teaching which clearly pointed to this extraordinary claim. They knew he was human, a real human being, but he's actually claiming to be divine, to be God, to be a God-man. And that's an extraordinary claim. First, I've mentioned one already. He said, I chose to be born. I came, even adding, I came from heaven. That's a clear claim to be divine. The second way in which he did it was his claim to forgive sins. Now, the only sins I can forgive you are the sins you've committed against me. I hope I can forgive that. But Jesus said, I'll forgive all your sins, all your sins against God. I can forgive them. Well, no, a human being can't do that. You can only forgive sins done against you. To forgive a person all their sins against God, you've got to be God to do that. And yet he did it. The third way was that claim to have a unique relationship with God. The only Jew who ever dared to call Abba, a very intimate relationship, and he never said, our father. He always referred to God as my father and your father, making a clear difference between his relationship and theirs. The fourth thing was to use God's name about himself. We know the name of God. You've, uh, will you just sing it? Was it up on the board? No. I am. I am. You know, once I asked the Lord, could you give me a simple English word that would correspond to your name? I'd like to use it. And quick as a flash into my mind came the word always. What a lovely name for God. Always. And that's what I am means. It's the present tense of the verb to be. It's not the straight verb to be. It's saying, always I am. I was around at the beginning. I'll be around at the end. I'm always here. around. I am. Some people just use the word being. But I like the word always. And I like the word, the name for Jesus, which is called yes. He is the yes to every promise of God. Fancy having a God called always, whose son is called yes. <laughs> what a positive religion is ours. <laughs> but he used those words, I am, and he didn't just say I am. He repeated the word I and always said, I, I am. And in Greek, that's ego, I, me. And I, me means I am, and then ego means I. So he began many of his sayings with I, I am. The bread of heaven, the good shepherd, the way, the truth, the life. Seven times. He referred to himself beginning with God's name. They're all in John's Gospel as it happens. On one occasion, 
he claimed to the Jews that Abraham was glad to see his day. And they said, you're not 50 years old. How do you know Abraham who's been dead these 2,000 years? And he said, before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews took up stones to stone him immediately because that was blasphemy. And the Moses law is exactly the same as the Muslim law. Blasphemy deserves death. It's one of the worst crimes a man can commit. And we're beginning to understand why he died. So that was number four used the same name as God of himself. Number five, he said, I am the only way to God. If you want to know God the Father, you'll have to come through me. In a word, he was condemning all other religions in the world. He's saying, you'll never get through to God the Father unless I help you come through me. Now that's an extraordinary claim. Number six, he claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, not a way among others, or a truth, or a possible life. He kept saying the way, the truth, the life. Nobody but God should say that. Number seven, he claimed that he would set people free from themselves by dying for them. And therefore he said, I came to die, to die at a very early age. And the only thing that kept him from dying was that the disciples had to know who he was before he died so they would see his death in the right light. And he took them way up to the foot of Mount Hermon. I hope you'll go there someday. It's an extraordinary natural feature. The River Jordan comes out of the foot of Mount Hermon, a full river straight out of the rock. The snow on the top of the mountain melts and it comes down inside a, uh, a fault in the rock and then it gushes out at the foot of the rock. And you might imagine that that was a special place and a special superstitious place. And so it was. And if you go there today, you'll see little alcoves carved in the cliff face, which held all manner of gods to worship. One of them was the god Pan, and the locality is still called Panias. And the god Pan was believed to be a Greek god who came in the appearance of a man. In another alcove was a statue of Caesar. That's why in Jesus' day, the village was called Caesarea Philippi, after the Roman Caesar and the local Jewish governor. And here was a man, Caesar, who was a man, but who was worshipped as a god. And it was there that Jesus took his disciples and he said, now who do you think I am? A God who's appeared as a man or a man who's God, who, who am I? And at first they said, well, you're a reincarnation of some great man, that's what, that's what other people say. Well, he said, whatever other people say, I need to know who you say. And for the first time, Simon Peter said, I believe you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He was the first man to say it. Do you know who was the first woman to say it shortly afterwards? The name is Martha, who was so good in the kitchen while her sister sat at Jesus' feet. But it was Martha who saw the truth of who Jesus was even before Mary. And that was the truth. And Jesus immediately said, now I can die. You know who I am, so you will understand now why I'm going to die. And he clearly indicated 
that he had decided when to die, how to die, and where to die. And he said, we're going straight to Jerusalem now, and I'm going to die there on a cross. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, there were five previous occasions when people had tried to kill him. The first time was in his own village, Nazareth, when he preached his first sermon in the synagogue. And they immediately tried to throw him off a cliff. Must have been a pretty good sermon. I've never had that experience. I'm amazed that a congregation hasn't thrown me off the cliff when I look at some of the sermons they've had to put up with. But fancy preaching one short sermon from the prophet Isaiah and all he said was, today you're seeing this happen. Now why did they do that? Were you ever puzzled? What was in that sermon that upset them so deeply? The answer was this. Nazareth is in the northern part of Israel called Galilee. It was a pretty rebellious part. It was where all the revolts happened and above all where all the false messiahs arose who promised to get rid of the Romans. And when these false messiahs were put to death, one of the things the Romans did was to destroy the village from which they came in Galilee to prevent any others coming. That happened in Czechoslovakia when Heinrich Himmler, the German officer in charge of the occupation was murdered. Then the Germans took a village in Czechoslovakia just outside Prague and they wiped it off the map. And it's now a shrine to remember that happening. Well, the Romans did the same thing. It was the way they kept messiahs down, killing them and wiping out the village they came from. And here's Jesus claiming to be the Messiah. And the whole of Nazareth was scared stiff that they would be wiped out by the Romans. So they said, better kill him and not be wiped out ourselves. You can understand it. And that was the first time that they tried to kill one man to save a lot of others. At his death, Caiaphas said, it's better for one man to die than that the whole people should perish with the same fear of the Romans. And in between, there were three other occasions when they tried to kill Jesus, but because it wasn't his time, he quietly and serenely walked through the crowd and away. But once the disciples knew who he was, he said, we're going and I'm going to die. Number seven, I've already said it. He set people free by dying for them. Number eight, he promised to come back before his body rotted. That was a promise God had made way back in Psalm 16, that if ever a holy person walked the earth, God would not let him rot in the grave. Very interesting promise, which is quoted in the New Testament. That was an extraordinary claim. You see, they were going to put him to death because he was too bad to live. And he died appealing to a higher court. He died saying, God will vindicate me. God will reverse your verdict. You will put me out of the world, but God will put me back in. And when we come to it, that's exactly what God did. Number eight, he said, oh, sorry, I've just told you. I will come back from the dead before rot sets in, which would mean before the fourth day. Number nine, I will be the judge of the whole human race. The future of every human being is in my hands. I will separate the entire human race as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. 
I'll do that. Pontius Pilate will one day be judged by Jesus. So will Adolf Hitler, so will you, and so will I, because he said, I am the judge. Now, all the Jews believed that God would judge them, but here's Jesus saying, no, I'm going to do it. And finally, number 10, he said, I will one day return to planet Earth for a second time to rule the whole world. Now, when you put all these 10 things together, any one of them wouldn't be enough, but there's a kind of cumulative evidence in those 10 things that made it absolutely clear that Jesus was saying he was God. Now you have only three choices now. Jesus was either mad, bad, or God. He was either a lunatic, a liar, or the Lord. You've got to make up your mind, every one of you. And every other human being who's not here has to make up their mind. Either he was deceiving himself and was crazy, schizophrenic or whatever, or he was a bad man deceiving a lot of other people and telling lies about himself, or he was telling the truth. You can't have it any other way. It must be one of those three. I had a big debate in London in a place called the Inns of Court where all the top lawyers in London have their uh, offices and we had a big debate was Jesus mad bad or God and we had a professor of psychology from London University whose conviction was that Jesus was schizophrenic that he was crazy and we had the president of the British Humanist Association saying that he was a very bad man and was fooling people with lies. And Muggins here had to say that he was Lord. <laughs> and I give the glory to God that we won the debate by 85%. But nevertheless, that's because I had a, a trick up my sleeve <laughs> called the resurrection. <laughs> and. Uh, come to that in a moment. So really, Jesus was crucified purely because he called himself God and for no other reason. And that, it was right to crucify him if he was not telling the truth, if he was blaspheming. And that was the first charge laid against Jesus by the Jewish court. And actually, they couldn't get witnesses to agree on what he said, and it looks as if they couldn't do anything with him. So finally, the judge did an illegal thing and charged him to condemn himself out of his own mouth and said, are you what you say you are? And he simply said, I, I am. And the man in charge of the court ripped his clothes and said, you've all heard him. We've got 70 witnesses who heard him call himself God. What is your verdict? And 68 of them said, we vote for his death. That's the only punishment fit for a man who uses those words. But they couldn't put him to death because they were under Roman authority and the Romans had forbidden them to exercise capital punishment. So they had to change the charge. And by the time they got to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, they changed it from blasphemy to treason, that he said he was king of the Jews. And that was treason in the Roman law. There's no Roman law against blasphemy, it's a Jewish law, but the Roman law was against treason. And that's how they got him killed. Now, there are some extraordinary, unique features of his death. 
They nailed him to a block of wood, stark naked with no loincloth, that's just on the Christian representations for decency's sake. But in utter humiliation, stark naked, he's nailed to a cross and left to die. But he didn't die of crucifixion. That's the extraordinary thing. What did he die of? Well, not crucifixion, because just to nail a man to a cross and leave him there takes a minimum of two days to kill him. And anything up to seven, that was the range of time it took. The average would be three or four days as he gradually suffocated. What killed a man on a cross was that he suffocated. When his legs became weak and he drooped and hung by his hands, the pressure on his lungs would be unbearable. So he would push himself up with his feet again and then the agony in his feet would set in and he'd flop again and this alternate flopping and pushing himself up is how they died until ultimately they couldn't push themselves up and suffocated. That's crucifixion. It's the most cruel, slow, lingering death that's ever been devised. And no Roman citizen would be subject to it. It was only done to others and only for the serious crime. So what did Jesus die of? Well, we know. When, by six o'clock in the afternoon, they wanted to bury him, the Roman governor sent soldiers to make sure he was really dead. They couldn't believe he was dead. The only way to hasten death was to use a, a spear to break the legs. And then they couldn't push themselves up to breathe. And so they came to the two thieves and they broke their legs. And immediately they hung and then perished fairly quickly. But when they came to Jesus, to their utter astonishment, he was already dead. But the soldiers had to make sure and they pierced under his ribs with a sword and there came out blood and water. Somebody who was there noticed it and has recorded it for us. What does that mean? Well, quite frankly, it means he died of a ruptured pericardium or in simple English, he died of a broken heart. Though he was on a cross and it would have killed him in a few more days, he died of a broken heart already. Why was that? He'd been six hours on the cross, only six hours. And during those six hours, the first three, he was entirely concerned with other people, not himself. He was concerned about the soldiers that put him there and said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He was concerned about his mother and asked John the Apostle to look after her. And he took her to his own home from that moment. He was concerned about the thief dying alongside. A thief with incredible faith who looked at this dying naked man on the middle cross and said, Lord, Remember me when you get your kingdom. What incredible faith. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So for three hours, while the sun shone and the noonday sun was hot and dry, he was concerned about others. But from midday to three o'clock, he was concerned for himself. His first concern was simply physical thirst. I'm thirsty. And they cruelly gave him vinegar to drink, which just makes you more thirsty. And then he cried out with a terrible cry, Lama, Lama, Sabathani. 
My God, my God, why have you left me? It's a terrible cry. And through that three hours, there was total darkness. The sun went out, just as the star had shone at his birth. Now the sun went out at his death. Do you realize what was happening? He was going through an experience of hell. Hell is a thirsty place. It's a lonely place because God isn't there. And it's a dark place too. Outer darkness, Jesus called it. Jesus went through hell for three hours so that none of us need go to that dreadful place. He was taking our place. But his final seventh word from the cross was a prayer that he'd learned at his mother's knee when he was a little boy. Every Jewish boy is taught to pray this good night prayer. As just before he goes to sleep, he was taught to say, into your hands I commit my spirit. The only difference from that boyhood prayer that Jesus made was to put the word Abba in front of it. Abba, into your hands I commit myself, my spirit. Now that means he was appealing to God to show the world that they'd been wrong to put him to death. He knew it was his father's purpose that he should die, but he also knew that it was his father's will to reverse the verdict before his body rotted. And so he said, I'll be back. Now, I mustn't get on to the resurrection. I preached all last Sunday morning on that. So you can get the recording. Just let me summarize. By the third day, he was back, eating supper with his disciples, cooking breakfast for them. This was real. It wasn't a ghost. In fact, he said, handle me and see, I'm not a ghost. He came back in the body. However, he left the grave clothes behind in the grave, which had just collapsed. There was nothing in them which means that his old body had simply disappeared and God had created a new body for him in the darkness of the tomb. And that new body had qualities the old body never had. It could pass through locked doors. It could disappear and appear at will. And for the next two months, he appeared and disappeared and did both. Why didn't he just come back and stay with them? Because he was teaching them in the only way that a good teacher could, that they would have to learn to depend on his invisible presence. And so Thomas, one of the twelve, was not there on the first Easter Sunday evening. And when they told him, he's alive, he's been here, look, Fish bones on that plate, he ate fish with us. And Thomas said, you're not going to fool me. No way. Unless I can put my finger through his hands and put my hand in under his ribs and feel that spear thrust, you're not going to get me to believe. One week later, they're in the same room and a well-known voice says, Thomas, you want to put your finger through my hand? Come and do it. You want to feel the scar in my side? You're welcome, come and do it. And dear Thomas never did. He realized in a flash of inspiration and said, my, my Lord and my God. Nobody's ever come back from death after three days, but nobody. They have been recovered from death. I have a friend in America who was 10 days dead and Christ raised him from the dead. Thomas Carinci is his name and he was a, a good pastor but uh, one day he developed a bad pain in the bottom of his back 
And when he went to the doctor, the doctor said, you've got a growth, a cancerous growth in your spine. And he said, it's a very dangerous operation to remove it. He said, I'll try, but uh, no guarantees. Uh, well, he tried having drugs, painkillers, and he became a drug addict on those drugs until finally one night he was so desperately in pain that he got hold of a gun which he had in the drawer of the bedside cabinet and he, he went through to the bathroom in his wheelchair and he put the gun to his head, pulled the trigger. And there were bullets in every hole except one. And he pulled the hammer against that one. And it just brought him to his senses and he wheeled himself back into the bedroom and told his wife what he'd done. He said, I can't bear this pain. Well, she said, you better go and have the operation. Better to run the risk of getting better or not than blowing your brains out. So he went. And in the hospital, he read a verse from one of the early Psalms which said, I go to sleep and I wake up, for the Lord is with me. And he wrote that on a piece of paper and kept it in his Bible. And then he went into the operating theater and uh, the anesthetist injected his spine with anesthetic and put too much in and he died. And uh, it, yes, it was a mistake, but it happened. And they tried to resuscitate him. They tried pumping his chest to get him to breathe again. The surgeon even climbed up onto his body and, and pushed his knees into his chest, but it was no use. And they watched the monitor of his heartbeat and it was level. And so they went out to the wife who was waiting outside and said, we're very sorry, uh, but we've lost him. And she said, no, you haven't. Go back and try again. She was quite a little woman, but she had a strong faith and a lot of courage. And she told them, go back in and try again. So they went back in and tried again. But nothing happened. And she refused to accept it. So they put him in a bed with a mechanical pump to his lungs to help him breathe and a mechanical thing on his heart to keep his heart pumping. But his brain was dead and they could get no response in his brain. Now that is clinical death and they could have signed a death certificate. But because of the, that little woman, they kept him going on the machines for 10 days. And then she came in to visit him and he was gone. And she said, where's my husband? And they said, well, we needed his organs for transplant and he did say we could have them. So we've switched the machines off and taken him to the morgue. And this little woman said, bring him back, bring him back. And they brought him back and hooked him up again, at which point he opened his eyes and looked at them. And he saw this little bit of paper on the floor that he'd written, and he nodded his head as much as say, pick that up. And they picked it up and read, I go to sleep <laughs> and I wake up <laughs> because Christ, the Lord is with me. Well, he became called the miracle boy of that center, which was the famous Stanford Medical Center in the States. And a few days later, well, no, they finally left him alone in the room. And he thought, the operation's been a success. <laughs> I've no pain. <laughs> And he got out of bed, but he had to unhook a bottle that was feeding him in his arm. And he got out of bed and he walked up and down the bedroom and he thought, the pain's gone. 
the operation has taken away the growth. And the nurse came into the room and she shrieked at him and said, get back into bed. But he said, I'm all right, I can walk. And a few days later, he walked out of that hospital without the bottle feeding him, because now he could feed himself. And the nurses and doctors <laughs> lined the whole passage and were cheering the miracle man as he left. I've seen the medical records of it, but he came back to his old body. He's still alive, but he will die again because that's not resurrection. Resurrection is recreation. Resurrection is a new body. And Jesus has never died again. Lazarus died again. The widow of Nain's son died again. That's coming back to life. But Jesus didn't come back to life. He went on to life. As I asked you on Sunday morning, where do you think Jesus got his resurrection clothes from? Did you think about that? The God who made a new body for him gave him new clothes at the same time. And you will have clothes in heaven because God will make those for your new body. And my new body is going to be just like his glorious body. And when you're 83, you can't wait to be 33 again. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to that. The resurrection is the central fact of Jesus' uniqueness. Nobody before or since has ever not come back to life but gone on to a new life with a new body. That's why he's called the firstborn of all creation. That's why we worship on a Sunday because it's the beginning of God's new creation. I must rush on. I've only a few minutes left. His ascension, which took place two months later. Two most unique things about that. Number one, he left this world two months after he died. I don't know anybody else who's done that, do you? Most people leave this world the day they die. But Jesus stayed around for two months and then he left. And furthermore, he took his body with him. Most people leave it behind. All people leave it behind. But Jesus is alive. Yeah. And that's why there is no tomb. Or there is an empty one. But they, there's no shrine that you can go and worship at. And worship a dead saviour. That's the difference. He is unique. He's one of a kind. There's no one like him. And that's why we can never mix our faith with other religions. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Two final comments. Number one, that says that the Christian faith is exclusive. It's unique like Christ is. Christianity is Christ. And therefore, it's exclusive. We can't ever consider the idea of mixing our faith with other faiths. And we may have to pay the heavy price for that stand as the religions of the world come together. But nevertheless, it's exclusive. And you can't mix truth with error. There is no other name under heaven by which a person can be saved except the name of Jesus. But by the same token, our faith is inclusive. It must be for everybody. Those two things go together. An exclusive faith must be inclusive. If it's the only way, then everybody has a right to hear it. And we have a right to tell them. We have a right to share it with them. And that's why Christianity must be a missionary religion, an evangelizing religion. It's our solemn duty when we found such a salvation. 
it's our solemn duty to go and share it with those who need it. However offensive that may be, and one of the pressures that will come upon us is a law forbidding proselytizing, as they call it. It won't be long before we are forbidden to try and convert someone of another faith to ours. But we have no choice. And there are already countries where that law is in operation. But we can't help it. Our Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all the nations. Yes. And we've got a duty to tell them that he's alive forevermore. And that he will judge everybody on earth. And that he's coming again to rule this world until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Amen.